Hi everyone and welcome to lecture three in this uh, lecture series on the foundations of blockchains. So in the last lecture, lecture two, we covered a famous possibility result. We gave a list of assumptions under which it was possible to solve the SMR problem, the state machine replication problem, uh, and get everything we wanted, specifically getting consistency and liveness. We did that by reducing uh, state machine replication to the Byzantine broadcast problem, which is a single shot consensus problem. Uh, and then we went through the Dole of Strong protocol, which guarantees validity and agreement for uh, the Byzantine broadcast problem, which as we saw last lecture was sufficient to get consistency uh, and liveness for SMR. So beginning with this lecture and continuing for the next few, we're going to switch our focus from possibility results to impossibility results. So now we're going to be identifying uh, sets of assumptions under which, in fact, there does not exist a good consensus protocol. For today's lecture, we'll revisit the Byzantine broadcast problem that we talked about in lecture two, and we will actually show that it is impossible in certain cases, that there does not exist any protocol that satisfies both validity and agreement under certain sets of assumptions. So this is a famous impossibility result. It's definitely part of the canon. It's definitely a good one to know. It's also going to illuminate the interesting role of cryptography in the design of consensus protocols. Also, as part of the proof, we will introduce two proof techniques, which are pretty common in impossibility results in distributed computing. The idea of an adversary that performs simulation and the idea of honest nodes being unable to distinguish uh, between different worlds in which different behavior is expected. So, impossibility results. Uh, you know, theory and math, uh, like we've been doing in the, in the last couple lectures, is great for proving positive results, possibility results, like, for example, the rigorous guarantees that we proved for the Dole of Strong protocol in the previous lecture. But arguably, theory might be even better for impossibility results, for delineating what you know computers or algorithms or protocols cannot do. Right? And I actually, think about like the history of computer science. Right? Uh, you know, arguably, the first academic computer science paper ever was Alan Turing's 1936 paper that introduced the Turing machine model of computation. In some sense, that was the, the intellectual birth of computer science as a field. And literally on day zero, like in that very first paper, Turing already showed an impossibility result, showed that there was no algorithm solving the halting problem. A more modern example would be the development of NP-completeness, okay, which again is a theory, part of theoretical computer science, uh, which explains why certain problems seem unsolvable by efficient algorithms. So distributed computing is really a, another part of computer science that is in large part defined by the fact that you can prove interesting impossibility results. And so a lot of the sort of richness of this academic discipline is just the, the very subtle curvature of the frontier between what can be done and what can't be done, depending on exactly what assumptions you make. Now, before I, I state the impossibility result that we're going to focus on in this lecture, let me just say a little bit about how you should interpret uh, impossibility results like this, what, what purpose they serve. Right? The point is not to have some kind of theoretician in an ivory tower sort of, you know, scold somebody that like they can't solve some problem. That is not the point at all. Obviously, it doesn't matter what I write down on these slides or what I tell you, people are not going to stop, for example, building blockchain protocols and putting them out into the world. Rather, the point of appreciating impossibility results is to know why you can't always have everything that you want, to be sort of educated about the compromises that are going to be required when you tackle a problem, like, for example, consensus. So if you go out there and you compare sort of different leading layer one consensus protocols in the blockchain world, you'll see that, you know, each of them has its own weaknesses, right? None of them are perfect. And so you may find yourself thinking, it's like, you know, why doesn't some super smart person just come along and just design one protocol to rule them all? Okay, one that has all of the good points of the leading protocols and none of the bad points. So theory and impossibility results in particular are going to tell us that that protocol does not exist. Okay, it's not that nobody's been smart enough yet to come up with a protocol without any of these weaknesses. It's that completely fundamentally, okay, there is no escape. Every consensus protocol must have one or more weaknesses. This gives you the lens through which to evaluate and compare different blockchain protocols and how they make different ways of dealing, of sort of escaping these impossibility results by different assumptions, relaxed guarantees, etc. 
So one great example is in the next couple of lectures, we'll see uh, maybe the most famous impossibility result in distributed computing, um, the FLP impossibility result on achieving consensus uh, in a fully asynchronous model. And that impossibility result is really going to lead us to the um, sort of sweet spot model of network communication, which is the most commonly used one when you talk about blockchain protocols, the, the so-called partially synchronous setting. And now, if I just wrote down the definition of a partially synchronous setting right now, you'd be like, that's super weird. Like, why did you do that? That's not what I want at all. But after we understand the impossibility results over the next couple of lectures, we'll realize that this model is going to be the perfect sweet spot. Okay, on the one hand, your assumptions are weak enough that it forces you to design protocols that really are useful in the real world. On the other hand, you do sort of assume enough that you escape these impossibility results and there really are uh, consensus protocols with provable guarantees. All right, so that's the, that's the reason we are spending time on these impossibility results. They uh, tell us when trade-offs are absolutely unavoidable. And then we can understand different consensus protocols as taking different approaches to these necessary trade-offs. All right, so let me tell you the impossibility result that we're actually going to prove in this lecture. So this is another just super classic result from distributed computing, again, from the, from the early 1980s, when a lot of the uh, foundations of that field were being laid. Uh, the result we'll talk about was basically proved originally um, by P. Shashuk and Lamport. These are actually the same, first, the same three authors of the paper we mentioned last lecture uh, that introduced the sort of Byzantine terminology, talking about the, the Byzantine generals coming to agreement um, in the presence of traders. So same set of authors, names in a different order, it is a different paper. Um, we're not, I'm not going to show you the proof from that 1980 paper. I'm going to show you a, a, a later um, sort of slicker proof uh, by FLM. So it's Fisher, Lynch, uh, and Merritt. And what this theorem is going to say, it's going to say Byzantine broadcast, right, the same problem that we focused on in lecture two, uh, Byzantine pro uh, broadcast is actually unsolvable if you have too many Byzantine nodes. So in particular, if at least a, thirds of the, a third of the nodes are Byzantine, remember, n denotes the total number of nodes uh, you know, participating in the protocol. Little f is our upper bound on how many Byzantine nodes we're trying to protect against. So f at least n over 3, that says if it's the case that at least a third of the nodes really are faulty, really are Byzantine. And in that case, this impossibility, impossibility uh, uh, result will rule out a correct solution to the Byzantine broadcast problem. And remember, correctness for Byzantine broadcast means two things. First, there's the safety condition, which is agreement, which is sort of no matter what, whether or not the sender is Byzantine or honest, it should always be the case that all of the honest nodes conclude the protocol with the exact same output. And then validity is the, is the liveness condition, which says that in the event that the sender happens to be honest, not only should all of the honest nodes agree, but they should all agree on whatever the private input of that honest sender was. All right, so that's the, that's the statement. If a third of the nodes or more are Byzantine, then, you know, too bad. You can't solve Byzantine broadcast uh, in the synchronous model. Now, you see that, and you should have a question, uh, which is like, didn't we just in the last lecture actually give a protocol for Byzantine broadcast satisfying validity and agreement no matter what F was? Wasn't that the whole point of the Dole of Strong protocol? Uh, yes, it is. So that's a good question. Why doesn't this impossibility result contradict the guarantees we proved for the Dole of Strong protocol? And it's not that either of the proofs is incorrect, okay? Both of the pr proofs are correct, but as you might expect, they're under slightly different sets of assumptions. And so what we're going to see is like the, the assumptions really matter, in particular, the cryptographic assumptions really matter of whether or not you can have highly fault tolerant solution to Byzantine broadcast in the synchronous model. So what I want you to do when we go through the proof of this result in the next video, I want you to sort of keep this seeming contradiction in mind. And, you know, maybe hard to spot it in real time, but this is one way to stay focused in the next video when we do the proof, is try to find a step of the proof which really doesn't apply for the Dole of Strong protocol. The proof will still apply to lots of other stuff, but, you know, because there's no contradiction, the, this, this result must somehow not apply specifically to the Dole of Strong protocol. So see if you can figure out why when we go through, when we go through the proof, and then we'll discuss it uh, in the final video of this lecture. 
And actually, to be honest, uh, you know, I'm going to assume a couple of things just to make my life easier. So first of all, I'm only going to be thinking about deterministic protocols for Byzantine broadcast, right? Randomization, that would make the arguments more complicated. Uh, randomization doesn't really rescue you from this impossibility result, but let's just prove it for the case of deterministic protocols. Uh, and secondly, I'm going to um, prove it only in what seems like kind of the trivial base case where we have um, three nodes one of up to one of which is Byzantine. So n equals three and f equals one. Notice, you know, that is in the regime where this impossibility result uh, claims to hold. And that probably seems like, you know, a ridiculously simple case to focus on, but actually the general case, uh, it reduces to the case of just three nodes, one Byzantine one. So any n, um, any number of nodes, any number of Byzantine nodes that at least is at least one third n, uh, basically you can sort of group the nodes into sort of three different sets and sort of treat them as basically like super nodes um, and then just sort of uh, piggyback on the proof we're about to give for the n equals three, f equals one case. Okay, so that's not, that shouldn't be obvious, you know, in real time. That's actually a really good homework problem if you want to think that through. Okay, so just sort of bear with me through the proof for the n equals three, f equals one case, and then think about how either you could rework the proof for the general n and f case, or even better, maybe you could avoid redoing the work and you could somehow reduce the general n and f case with f at least n over three to the case we we're about to prove, n equals three, f equals one. All right, so in, in the rest of this video, sort of in preparation for doing the proof in the next video, I want to sort of give you some intuition behind why some result like this uh, might be true. And I got to warn you, the intuition is quite vague. Uh, the proof we're going to see, it's quite slick. So it does, you know, basically encode this intuition, but there is some distance between them. But still, you know, I want to give you some sense of like, you know, what's driving this, like why this one third, what's driving that? All right, so think about the case where you have three nodes, you know, A, B, C, Alice, Bob, and Carol. So I'm going to draw this setup just as a graph with three vertices of the nodes and then three edges. The edges just sort of represent, you know, the point-to-point -point communication between, you know, A and B, B and C, and C and A. And the vague intuition is that, you know, while if you're an honest node running a protocol in this setup, you might be able to detect that something's awry that some node has been behaving inconsistently, but you're not going to be sure which of the other two nodes it is. Like, let's say that Alice is the sender. Remember in Byzantine broadcast, you have n nodes, one of them, and it's known up front who it is, is the sender. The sender has a private input that, at least if they're honest, they want to sort of communicate to all of the other nodes. So let's sort of play the role of Bob, this node B, okay? And assume that we're honest and we're just trying to actually, you know, really satisfy agreement and validity as demanded by the Byzantine broadcast problem. Now, for all we know, the sender is Byzantine, okay? And, uh, you know, what do Byzantine senders usually do? They usually send out conflicting information to the other nodes. So totally possible that A's Byzantine told me, told us one thing and told Carol something else. Now, we could compare notes with Carol, you know, kind of say, hey, what did you hear from Alice? Here's what we heard from Alice. Um, but the problem is, you know, for all we know, Carol's the Byzantine one, right? So maybe the sender's honest and actually sent out consistent information, but Carol's going to make it look like Alice sent out inconsistent information. Right, so the problem is, if, you know, if we're Bob, we really, you know, if, we're, if we hear conflicting information from Alice and Carol, we really don't know which of them to blame, Right. I mean, if we had sort of three other nodes we could talk to, you know, maybe we could take a majority vote. Okay, Only one would be Byzantine, two would be honest. That might give us enough information to do a majority vote. But, you know, if all we have are these two nodes, we, we sort of know one is messing around, but we can't figure out who, you know, then it's really not clear how to proceed. Now, if you're really on top of things already at this level of vague intuition, you might be suspicious. You might start having an inkling of why this isn't going to work for the Dole of Strong protocol. In particular, the second of the three things that I wrote down, um, if you think about the assumptions we made when for the Dole of Strong protocol, that second step should feel a little fishy to you. Okay, if that, if, you know, if you don't see that yet, that's fine. Uh, but that's again what you should be keeping in mind as we go through the proof in the next video. Somehow this proof cannot be sort of applying to Dole of Strong. What is it about the Dole of Strong protocol and its guarantees that prevents the proof we're about to see uh, from working? So that's everything I wanted to say in preparation for actually doing the proof. So let's now actually do the proof. <laughs> That'll be the point of the of the next video. Uh, it's a very slick, very clever proof. And again, it's a very kind of famous impossibility result. So I definitely encourage you to to watch the video and sort of appreciate you know the marvel of the argument. 
Um, if you feel like skipping that proof, uh, then you should definitely still watch the third video uh, that's part of this lecture uh, when we discuss at some length, you know, why is it that this FLM impossibility result uh, doesn't contradict the Dolev Strong Protocol. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video for the, for the proof of this impossibility result.